السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد Now, before beginning with the next ayah of Surah Fatiha, that is ayah number four, I would like to recall that in the previous session, most of you all had requested me to, for the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, regarding which I had mentioned in the previous session. Now, this is shown on the screen, the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. It reads as, Allahumma inni a'udhu bi radaka min sakhatik wa bi mu'afatika min ukhubatik wa a'udhu bika minka la uhsi thana'an alayk anta kama athnayta ala nafsik The meaning is, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in your pleasure from your anger and in your forgiveness from your wrath. And I seek refuge in you from you. I cannot completely praise you for what you are. You are as you have praised yourself. So this is the dua. This was the time when the Prophet was in Sajda for a very long time reciting this dua. When he was asked about this, this is what he replied. So he says, I cannot completely praise you for what you are as you have praised yourself. Now we go to the next ayah. The next ayah is, Iyaka na abudu wa iyaka na star'een. Now, the, our entire existence revolves around this particular ayah. Iyaka na abudu wa iyaka na star'een. Now, in the previous three ayahs, we were addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the third person. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawmeddin. Now, we are shifting to address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly in the second person. So, which brings us closer to Allah. It makes us more intimate towards Him, towards, uh, towards the one whom we are addressing. So without knowing, without accepting and recognizing the qualities of Allah which have been mentioned in the first three ayahs, our ibadah, our worship of Allah is useless. So we stand in salah as an individual. But when making this statement that I have come to, the ayah number four, we address Allah not as an individual, but we address on behalf of the entire Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, which shows one Ummah, one commitment, one goal. So discipline and unity in spite of the differences that we have within the Sharia and what we have split ourselves into various texts, we still have to address ourselves in plural form for the entire Ummah of the Prophet So we will address what Ibadah is now. What does it encompass? And what are the different categories of Ibadah that we find from this particular Ayah? So we then ask Allah for His assistance. Now let us look back at the first three Ayahs. Now we have done the Tafsir of these Ayahs you recall them, and then Allah makes us recognize Him, accept Him for what He is. Now we talk. Uh, we were talking about Him. Now what is it that we have? What do those ayahs mean to us? What should be the result of our knowing those particular qualities of Allah? 
does this not bring to us the realization of the greatness of Allah on the one hand and our weaknesses and shortcomings on the other hand and also our helplessness and total dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does this not bring in us the desire to want to worship him in order to get closer to him? Does it not make us ultimately to draw ourselves towards the creator, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So for example, if someone does you a favor and you are greatly benefited by it, would you not volunteer yourself to help that person? You've done so much for me, now I want to do something for you. In a similar manner, can we have the next slide, please? Looking at the importance of this particular surah, Ibn Qayyim, next slide, please. Ibn Qayyim said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed 104 books and he has combined the knowledge of all these books into the Torah, the Injil, and the Furqan. The Zubur also is part of that. He combined the knowledge of these three particular books into the Quran. And then he combined the knowledge of the Quran in the last part of the Quran, that is the 30th part of the Quran. And then he combined the knowledge of these, this particular last surahs in Surah Al-Fatiha. And he combined the knowledge of the entire Surah Fatiha in this one ayah, Iyaka na abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. So Ibn Taymiyyah states that all the knowledge of the Quran has been combined in Surah Fatiha and the knowledge of Surah Fatiha is found in the ayah number four. So we now come to the statement of our goal and our commitment. What do we say? Iyaka na abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Now, iya, iya means only, only, exclusively, no one is included in this. Iya, ka, ka means you. When you combine these two, you have iya, ka, only you, exclusively you. This is how we are addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly and we are feeling more closer to him and more intimate. And how do we say, Allah, we are addressing you only and no one else. Now one note of caution that I would like to give here is, many people say iyaka. They ignore the shadda. But please be careful. You cannot say iyaka, the meaning changes into something else. So iyaka is how you should actually pronounce this thing. So we are putting Allah first, the most important one first, by saying this, we always want to be near to Allah. Now, in the ultimate way to get the nearness to Allah, we are admitting that Allah is the only one worthy of ibadah, worthy of worship and obedience. Understand? So don't be in such a hurry that you remove that iyaka and you say iyaka na abudu. It makes no sense. Can we have the next slide, please? So when we are addressing, when we are talking to Allah as an individual, however, we are making it plural here by saying na'budu, which comes from the word abada. Abada in Arabic means worship. That's the root of the word. All those thoughts and actions of a slave towards the owner, the creator, the master, master is known as Abada, Ibada. Now, what is the relationship between being a slave and worship? You understand? What is the difference in that one? Now, worship is a demonstration which is the proof of one's slavery. If you are ready to accept being a slave of Allah only, then it gives you freedom from all types of slavery in the dunya. 
But if you become a slave to the dunya, then you, your entire akhirah is also ruined. Now, let us see what exactly is ibadah. So, there is, you can't achieve anything. There is no status. There is no greater honor. There is no greater role that we have. There's no greater goal that we can achieve other than being a slave of Allah. Now, what is ibadah? Ibadah is a 24 bar 7 occupation with Allah. This is the occupation of a believer. It shows extensive humility. It shows submission. It shows obedience. It shows complete and unconditional acceptance of the authority of the one to whom we are submitting. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, Ibadah, when we look at it further, it involves three aspects. Now, the first aspect, the next slide, please. The first aspect is worship and adoration, where your humility comes forward first. The next is obedience and submission, which comes from the fear of displeasing of displeasing Allah. The next is service and subjection. Service and subjection, not only through our actions, but also through our thoughts. Now, all this is centered around the love of Allah. Now, when you look at the word love of Allah, let us look at the type of loves that we have here as covered by this particular word love for Allah. The first is a natural love. You understand? A natural love, the kind of feeling of emotion, of gratitude, due to a good that has been done to you, believers appreciate the good that Allah has done for us and for the entire people, even the disbelievers in fact. There is a hadith which mentions the one who is not grateful to the people is not grateful to Allah. Right. The next type of love that we cover here is the Sharia love, which is the combination of both the natural and the emotional love. The next slide, please. The Sharia love. This Sharia love is the love that rules our lives and cannot be based on the natural love alone. You understand? The fact of what you, have, you love is deserving of your love. Like loving Allah and loving things that Allah loves. This is how we go about it. So intellectual love. It is also intellectual love because you know that what deserves love has the qualities and the capabilities of deserving that particular love. The next that we come across is the emotional love for Allah, for all the bounties that he has given us, even though we don't deserve certain things, he just gives it to us. So it is a beautiful dua in this particular thing. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbak. Oh Allah, I ask of your love and the love of those whom you love and the love to do all the things, the acts which will bring me closer to your love. It's a beautiful ayah. This worship comprises of extreme love, extreme submission, a total humbleness to Allah and the complete and unconditional love for Allah and the longing to meet Allah. The real desire of ibadah should be in our hearts. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, we'll break it up and now find out what exactly ibadah is. What is this worship that we are referring to? So, Ibadah is statement by the tongue. You express what you have to say. 
the statement of the heart through your iman. Then the actions of the heart, which is the feelings, the love, the hope, the sincerity, etc., which is the driving force behind which the actions of the body follow. So it all starts from the basically from the heart. Now, physical actions of the body. After this comes the physical actions of the body, which is our salah, our zakat, our fasting, our doing good for others, doing hajj, performing hajj, etc., which is done only for the sake of Allah, solely for the sake of Allah. And then ibadah is also based on our character, our behavior towards others, our duty towards our duty in our, what we do towards others also. All this forms a part of the, act, uh, the ibadah that we have. Allah has given us the freedom to choose whether we want his guidance and or whether we follow it or we don't want it and we don't follow the guidance. The choice is ours. So if Allah in his love and mercy sends you guidance, then it is obligatory that you seek and follow the guidance and benefit by it. Now again, yeah, so again, the acts of ibadah that we talk, many of us Muslims think that these acts such as salah, saum, everything are only rituals. No, they are not rituals. Do not consider the ibadah as just some physical thing that you have to go through some motions. Now, the salah is also ibadah. It is not a mechanical gesture by which you raise your hands up, then go to the ruku, then do your sajda, etc. Each one has a very great in-depth meaning behind this. Your work also is an ibadah. The manner in which you achieve your earnings are you doing it in a halal way or are you doing it in a haram way? Like you, the office timings are 9 to 5. You come at 9.30. The employer pays you from 9. So that 9 to 9.30, the half an hour, has been a haram earning for you when you get it. So you have to be extremely careful how you devote your work as an ibadah. Now go to your leisure. Yes, you want to take rest. You have, want to have some leisure. Even in that leisure, please make sure you have the halal and the haram in it. Don't go and, go and uh, do whatever you want to do. Find out what Allah is pleased with. And through this, you attain your leisure. Can we have the next slide, please? There are four categories of people who do ibadah. One is the people of ikhlas the people of sincerity. A class is sincerity towards Allah by following the way of the Prophet. They don't want to do anything from man. They don't want anything from mankind. They don't want rewards or appreciation. They don't want any status. They don't want any honor from the creation. They don't even care what others think of them. To them, People are, are as good or as no different than the, those who are in the grave. They don't matter at all. Those who are knowledgeable of Allah and who are aware what human beings are in reality, they cannot harm them or benefit them unless what Allah will. So many times we are afraid, what, are, what is this person going to do to me? What is that person going to do to me? But Unless and until Allah wills it, nothing can be achieved. The second category of people is the people who do not connect actions, who, who I'm sorry, the people who do correct actions but are not sincere. They are not people of ikhlas. They don't follow the way that the Prophet has told them to follow. Doing all kinds of actions, including innovations, having all kinds of beliefs, claiming that they are something wonderful just to get the praise of the people. This is the second category. 
The third category is the people who are sincere, but they don't follow the way of the prophet. They are very devout in their worship, but they don't have the correct knowledge on how to do the worship. Some people even go to the extreme of singing, dancing, get to, getting into worlds and all that by doing the, while doing zikr, and they get into trances. They think that this is ibadah. That's the third category of people. The fourth category of people are the people who follow what the prophet brought to them, but doing it with the intention of being seen by others. This is a very dangerous thing. You're only doing it to show off. Go to the factors that can deviate us from the proper ibadah. You understand, our base desires are always prompted by the shaitan and also by the disbelievers. So Allah tells us in many places in the Quran about the relationship between the shaitan and the human beings. How the shaitan is trying to take us away from the ibadah of Allah. So the moment we say, na'abudu, we have hope that Allah will guide us. We have hope that Allah will guide us, but then we must also realize that the shaitan is making every effort to take us out of the concentration during salah. He is more ready to draw us attention away from the ibadah so that we don't perform the ibadah the way we are supposed to perform. The next slide, please. So this is the first part where we spoke about iyaka na'abudu, where our ibadah, we are committing our ibadah to him in every aspect of our life. It's not restricted to salah. Now this is wa iyaka nastareen. Now wa iyaka na'abudu is the previous one where we said, we set the goal. That's my goal. Iyaka nastareen is the means by which we are going to attain or achieve the goal. This is the second part of the ayah 4. So, va means and, iyaka, we have already mentioned, only you, exclusively you, nastareen. We are continuously seeking the attention of Allah, seeking the assistance of Allah. So, the quality of a true believer is someone who constantly and continuously seeks Allah's assistance in whatever he's doing. Whether he's doing his work or he's doing his ibadah or he's performing some, anything that he does, even helping the people is part of his ibadah. So he always keeps asking Allah, Ya Allah, please guide me to do it the right way. So since we know and accept that we are, our, we are on our own and we just cannot do anything unless and until Allah helps us on this. So we are asking Allah to assist us, to help us so that we can earn his uh, blessings and he could accept all the good deeds that we do. Okay, now, now here I would like to concentrate on one thing. There's a word Nasr in Arabic which means help. Now, when you see the word Nasr as help, the word Nasr in Arabic is seeking help during an emergency. Seeking help during an emergency. So somebody, you have fallen down, somebody comes and picks you up and helps you get back to the normal thing. That is called Nasr. It is only a momentary help. But Allah says here, he does not use the word Nasr. You say, Nastareen, we are continuously asking you for your assistance. So the more we turn towards Allah, the more, we, the more he comes to us and he will continue to assist and help us in our things. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah, Iyaka Nastareen. Now, again, if you see this, first you say, Iyaka na'abudu. Only you we worship. Iyaka nastareen, 
we are asking you for assistance, but here it is not mentioned what is the assistance you want. So beautifully, Allah Ta'ala has left it open. You can put anything there. You can ask for his continuous assistance in ibadah, in your work, in your dealing with people, in your dealing with your business, in your dealing with your relatives, etc. So the object of what you're asking assistance is not mentioned here. It is very general. It can be for anything and everything that we require help from Allah. You will note that Iyaka is repeated the second time. You could have said Iyaka Nabudu wa Nastarin. Now, the wisdom of Allah, His mercy, His love for us, you can find from this one. He makes you repeat Iyaka. It's re repeated in this ayah. We would think that it's not necessary, that it's absolutely an unnecessary word. But ibadah is one thing, and your other actions are something else. Ibadah will be great, but, oh, but still, in case you want some other assistance, Allah is ready to help you. Okay, just ask for assistance. There are no prerequisites. There are no conditions for you to ask for this assistance. And this you're using in the Surah Fatiha. We are worshipping you. We are seeking your assistance in whatever we do. So Allah very subtly makes it independent for the sake of that person, making him know that even if he is not doing ibadah, he can still ask Allah for assistance and Allah will help. You may find it also in the disbelievers that whatever they want, even though they don't believe in Allah, still Allah grants them this one. You understand? So can we have the next slide, please? So some people may not be interested in ibadah at all. And they may even not be interested in seeking the help from Allah. But sometimes they may turn to Allah in terms of any difficulty, in terms of a calamity, and they may turn to Allah to meet their personal desires and the goals that they have. And Allah may respond and even give that to them. They may even ask Allah for what is not pleasing to Allah. And still Allah may give it to them. But in this process, they are actually increasing the distance the, the, of their, their distance from Allah. Because they are not going to use that blessing of Allah, that Allah, that assistance of Allah, which He has given them in a way that would please Allah. Instead of being grateful to Allah, what do they do? They misuse it, thereby increasing their disobedience to Allah. It's a very subtle way of Allah making them do this to ultimately face the music in the Akhirah. The next uh, slide, please. One glaring example is when the shaitan asked Allah to give him respite till the day of judgment. Allah responds and he accepts the uh, request. So the fact that Allah responds to the request of someone or the dua of someone does not necessarily mean that Allah loves them, that Allah is pleased with the person, that Allah is happy with what the person is doing, or even that the person is on the straight path. On the other hand, someone may ask Allah, and Allah may not give them what they ask for out of his love, his wisdom, in a way that he protects them from any calamity that may happen because Allah knows best what is good for them. And it may result in something much better for that person. It may remove something bad from that person. So the ignorant person may think that Allah does not love him if Allah does not grant what he makes dua for. This is not necessarily the case. We have to be very careful in this. The next slide, please. So if we get something, even though we did not ask, ask Allah for, then we have to make sure that 
this help to us is in uh, to, this help this helps us in increasing our ibadah to allah i'm sorry even we didn't ask and still he has given which means that it should help us to increase our ibadah to allah if a person has given what he has asked allah for asked allah and another person does not get what he has asked it does not mean that one prayer is un answered and another is not answered the wisdom of allah is infinite he knows what to give when to give and what is the best way to give so in this world allah gives to everyone even to the disbeliever even to the wrong doer it is not what he gives but what we do with what he gives which is very important for us so be careful what you ask for even if you see in it something good for yourself ask allah on the condition that it if it is good for me please give it to me if it is not good for me you please don't give it to me i'm ready to accept it this is one big point of the istikhara which is recommended many times for us so salah is the best way of seeking allah's assistance at all times we do salah five times a day at all times especially when we are facing problems and challenges surah baqara what is uh, what the surah baqara say istaeenu bis sabri wa salah face things with patience and salah so ibadah comes first and then you seek the assistance of allah now we come to this slide how does allah respond to this commitment of us hada baini wa baina abdi now he's allah says this is exclusively between me and my slave hada baini wa baina abdi and the next is wali abdi ma sa'alt for my slave is whatever he has asked just imagine for a moment a moment of time when you are sincere when you are concentrating on this this is the promise that allah makes that this is exclusively between me and my slave and i am ready to give whatever my slave asked how sad when allah is promise to give you just don't ask anything or your mind is somewhere else it's very very sad now by saying this hada baini wa baina abdi it implies privacy it's imply it implies closeness and intimacy a confidence a relationship which may not be present with anyone else at all and the feeling that i am closer to allah this is how allah responds may allah make us realize that with each ayah allah gives makes a response and we should be very careful to take advantage of what allah responds to these things can we have the next slide please so what happens here is when we say iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in we have come to a stage where we have committed to allah that you the first three ayahs show his greatness the next one ayah shows our com commitment to allah that you are going to do ibadah and this is followed by the next ayahs so i would like you to rethink on these particular ayahs once again Uh, we will stop with this for now in the next session we'll take up ayah number 5 inshallah may allah guide us in every way and help us to get closer to him amin ya rabbil alamin we'll do the dua now allahumma inna nas'aluka imanan mustaqima wa fadlan daima wa nadrar rahma ونزر الرحمة وعلم نافع وأخلا كاملا وخلب منورة وتوفيق إحسانا وتوبة نسوها وصبر جميلا وأجر عظيما ولسان ذاكرة وبدن صابرة ورزق واسع 
وسيم مشكورا وذنب مغفورا وعمل مقبولا ودعاء مستجاب وجنة الفردوس نعيما برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله